Thousands of patrons packed into the lavish Beverly Hills Supper Club, blissfully unaware that their evening of revelry is about to erupt in a hellish inferno. Within minutes of the first flames, a tsunami of smoke and heat engulfed the sprawling complex, rapidly turning escape into a death trap for those unable to find exits. Was it an accident or a deliberate act to cover up the club's secrets? It's Memorial Day weekend, and the Beverly Hills Supper Club is filled to the brim. The parking lot is jammed with cars, and the club is hosting several events, including a highly anticipated John Davidson concert. The evening will, however, be marred by overcrowding and a disregard for safety regulations. In total, it's believed that up to 3,000 patrons were at the club that night, more than double the fire code's allowance for a venue with its number of exits. The cabaret room, where the concert took place, was packed well beyond its safe capacity. Most of the deaths would tragically happen here. Located at the end of a corridor, it was far away from the club's main entrance. More and more rooms had been added to the building over the years, turning it into a sprawling 65,000 square foot entertainment complex. Trouble had already begun at the Zebra Room earlier in the evening when a wedding reception ended abruptly. At about 8.30 p.m., the party had to leave because of excessive heat and strange noises emanating from below the floor. The venue would remain vacant until an employee smelled smoke at 8.59 p.m. Entering the room, she observed a thick, dark smoke suspended beneath the ceiling. The fire department was alerted minutes later while employees grabbed extinguishers to fight the flames in the ceiling. I want all Covington squads available to respond to this address. They had no idea that opening the doors to the zebra room fed fresh oxygen to the fire and caused a flashover. Extinguishers would prove useless against the growing inferno. Firefighters arrived at the scene at 9.06 p.m., already seeing smoke cascading from the building as they approached. More than 520 firefighters from 24 fire stations tackled the fire in the maze of a building. The blaze swiftly devoured curtains and other flammable furnishings, releasing toxic gas and dense black smoke into the air. It raced up a spiral staircase, blocking the most viable exit for nearly 200 people on the second level, then surged down the hallway toward the cabaret room. Investigators would later determine the fire spread rapidly, reaching the cabaret room within two to five minutes. As a result, the news of the fire and the first sign of smoke and flames arrived simultaneously in the cabaret room shortly after 9 p.m. Inside, were an estimated 900 to 1,300 guests, more than double the normal amount. Chairs and tables had been placed in the aisles, ramps, and stairways to accommodate everyone. Patrons started moving towards the room's exits, when at around 9.10 p.m., the power went out. In total darkness, panic ensued, and people started to push and shove as the fire blocked two of the cabaret room's three exits. The crowd funneled through the single remaining exit where bodies pushed up on each other, creating an impenetrable crush that overwhelmed rescuers' attempts to pull people to safety outside. When I got to the inside doors, which is about 30 feet inside the building, I saw these big double doors and people were stacked like cordwood. They were clear up to the top. They just kept diving out on each other, trying to get out. I looked back over the pile of, it wasn't dead people, they were dead and alive in that pile. And I went in and I just started to grab them two at a time and pull them off the stack and drag them out. Many patrons who managed to escape the crush became lost, suffocating in the dense smoke while attempting to find alternative ways out. The absence of a functional fire alarm system in the expansive complex further exacerbated the disaster as people in isolated venue rooms remained oblivious to the impending danger. But there were other problems as well. The supper club failed to meet several basic safety standards for a venue of its size and usage. They weren't equipped with firewalls, an automatic fire suppression system, nor smoke detectors. Additionally, most exit paths from function rooms awkwardly led inward through narrow internal corridors and service areas rather than lead directly outside, hindering evacuation attempts. 
These shortcomings proved fatal that night, as the temperature in the cabaret room soared to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Firefighters were unable to safely attempt any further rescues. By 11.30 p.m., Incident Command anticipated the imminent collapse of the building's roof and evacuated all the firefighters. The raging fire was only brought under control a few hours later, but some parts of the building would continue to burn for the next two days. By the early hours of May 29th, authorities had retrieved 134 bodies from the premises. Three days later, when the recovery operations shut down, a total death count climbed to 162. The number of victims would later increase even more. 99 bodies were recovered from the cabaret room on the night of the fire in the vicinity of Exit A, the double swinging doors to the left of the stage. Additionally, 34 more bodies were found near Exit B, located to the right of the stage and in close proximity to the dressing rooms. 26 victims were discovered in the ashes from the area surrounding Exit A. All but two patrons perished within 30 feet of an exit. Three more fire victims would later die in a hospital, bringing the death toll to 165. While 2,600 people made it out alive that night, more than 200 people were also injured. As investigators sifted through the ashes, a trail of negligence and safety hazards told the true story behind the fire. They concluded that the fire's origin in the zebra room ceiling was sparked by faulty aluminum wiring. Shockingly, it was also revealed the architect lacked proper licensing. In addition to the numerous safety violations in the building's design and fire protection, the disaster was worsened by delayed detection, insufficient employee training, and overcrowding. But was it a faulty wire that caused the fire, or was something more sinister at play? Demolition of the remains of the building began almost immediately before the ashes of the fire had completely cooled, damaging critical evidence. A local fire marshal added that their investigations were shut down shortly after, leading them to believe the fire was arson-related. Furthermore, the club owner had reportedly received a letter threatening arson on the night of the fire. Over the years, several club employees have maintained the same stance and claim seeing some suspicious activities on the day of the blaze. They asked, what are you guys working on? And uh, they told me the air conditioning system. And I had no way to know that there was no air conditioning system in that room. Brock says his suspicions were confirmed a few days after the blaze when he asked about the work done in the zebra room. To the oldest son, Rick Schelling uh, Jr.'s attention that there was two maintenance people working in the room the day of the fire, and he says, no, that was six weeks prior. And I said, no, the day of the fire, they were there. And Mr. Schelling at that time said, well, they burnt my dad out then. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, uh, they finally got to him. In the aftermath of the fire, investigations initiated by the state of Kentucky, a grand jury, and a special prosecutor were all terminated without public trial suits against the owners of the building and the public utility were settled out of court. As a result, the Beverly Hills fire would never be subjected to a full-fledged public trial. Then, in a groundbreaking decision, the victims' families filed the first class action mass tort lawsuit in U.S. history. This meant, instead of just suing the nightclub, they took on the aluminum electrical wire industry as a whole saying it was the reason for the fire. It was a bold move, but it worked, and ultimately settled for $49 million out of court. Even though nothing has come of the reports of possible arson, the tragedy prompted stricter fire codes, including mandatory sprinklers, smoke alarms, and voice alert systems. It also initiated the banning of all aluminum wiring in future building projects. Today, a statue and two crosses stand watch at the location where gross negligence and alleged mob activity claimed the lives of 165 innocent victims, making it the third deadliest nightclub fire in U.S. history. Watch this episode next if you found this video interesting. 
please add a like and leave a comment if you want to support the channel.